Hello, we've got a lot to cover in this one. I'm in front of the most gorgeous cabinets ever. There's a Kickstarter linked on screen now and down below. You can go and check them out. They are wonderful. I'm going to be picking some models to go in them in this week's tutorial with a brand new contrast method. We're just going to be using three different contrast paints and one paint, which is Screaming Skull. So it's all Games Workshop, very easy to get hold of. And that will paint 90% of this model in not very much time to quite a high standard in an unintimidating fashion. Does that sound too good to be true? It's not. It's great. It's great fun. This is the most fun that I've had painting something in quite a long time, actually. It's not just because I really love turquoise. Look, he's exactly matching that piece of artwork. Anyway, um, we're trying out that method. It's great fun. I'd recommend it to anyone. If you tried out Slapchop, it's kind of like that, uh, but a bit fiddled around with. We're doing some techie stuff. Next thing, Games Workshop are giving away free models. Why is no one talking about these free busts that are in all these kits? That's a really high quality bust. It comes for free in a kit. You don't lose anything. You can build the other version. Please help us populate a list down below. Just put all your suggestions for what kits come with a free bust. We will put them all in the pin sticky. And then if any of you are looking and you're like, oh, what kits come with them? Then you can click the first comment below this that will be pinned and there'll be a big list that pops up. Uh, that'll also have the Kickstarter at the top of it if you want to check the Kickstarter out with the gorgeous cabinets. That we're going to be putting these models in. But yeah, Games Workshop are giving away free models. They're really nice to paint. I had loads of fun. This technique is awesome. Let's jump in. Okay. What on earth am I talking about? So this is a model from Games Workshop. It's the dragon we've already seen. You can assemble it in two ways. It's got some really helpful instructions, apart from the bit where the same piece is listed twice and the hole that it had in it. This is an early one. I think they fixed this uh, since then. So I'll be having to fix that later. Now, I wonder if you guys have guessed already what I'm gonna talk about. What I'm interested in is this, this completely separate, really cool piece. And it's not just that we get that, it's that we get the two versions, we get the two dragons. So this is the head that I'm going to be using on my dragon. It's my favourite one, looks kind of regal. I don't like the jewellery, so that won't be going on there. Oh, go on. Clumsy. There we go. Here it is. That's a great looking head. Second place, we have this, which I've mounted like that. It comes out exactly like a bust. And so we're going to be testing a paint scheme quickly on this. It's smaller, it's more convenient. I care about it less because it's not the model. So, you know, I think that's actually really helpful for getting a good paint job. And uh, yeah, let's jump in. If this goes well, maybe we'll apply what we've done here to what we've got here. I mean, just as a, a really obvious note, if you've not got much time, but you still want to work out your paint scheme, this took so much less time to build and prepare to a decent level than the entire dragon. This is gonna be a really important uh, tool that I use in the future with models like this to allow me to end up with something cool by accident to put on my shelf and also to, uh, to learn some stuff. Maybe I'll paint it completely differently and just keep it like that, in which case I got to learn about painting this and ended up with something cool almost accidentally. So first steps first, we have our bust. What a wonderful model. This in theory should go well because this, the recording didn't work. Unfortunately, he looks awesome. So we've got a close mouth version. Gonna prime the palette. It's all pink and zinchy. Been doing some pretty nice wings recently. That may have just been a tutorial. So we're gonna prime in black, fresh start, new beginning, and then we're gonna bash this out and he's gonna look incredible. Still drying, but we've got a fresh clean state to start. You can see here, people often ask me about texture packs. Just prime them and go again, guys. See how long I've used this one. Massive amount of paint built up here on the right hand side because I'm right handed. See that I put it down in lines very frequently. Okay, so. Step number one. Now you could airbrush this if you wanted. You could uh, do this all with dry brushing, but what I'm gonna do is I'm grabbing the excellent, far improved best white ever from GW spray, and I'm gonna spray it from one particular angle. And that angle is the angle that you can see I'm holding at now. I'm gonna spray it from above lightly, about 45 degrees. And I'm gonna give it a, 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 like a targeted blast in this direction. It's gonna kind of light him like a photograph, so. I'll come back and you'll be able to see how that looks. So first step, we're gonna do some targeted dry brushing all over this model and then specifically in the same targeted area that we gave it a heavier spray from. We've already got a white down, so some people may think that there's no point in this, but the white from that spray is very, very different to the white that we're gonna be using. We're using an extremely strong white and as a result, we can expect it to make a difference. Also putting paint down by hand is always gonna end up with a different result and by airbrush or from a spray can. So let's go, dampening pad is activated. Take a small amount of the white. It's very strong, we won't need much. You can see what we use the texture for here. 
gonna show us how the paint's gonna behave on the model. Twisting the brush as we go to make sure that it's covered from all angles. And then we're just going for an all over dry brush. All of these physical details that we've got, the ones that stick out more are gonna get hit more. And the lovely texture that's on the model, we're gonna make the most of that before we go to our contrast steps. This should be a perfect place to show it off. So all these scales, there we go. See, I'm using gentle buffing motions. If there's anywhere I can't reach, I'll swap to a smaller brush. I'm not sure if I'll need to though. It's quite a chunky model, all in all. And the particularly recessed areas like the neck and stuff like that, they're gonna be dark anyway from the way that we're painting it. There you go, this gorgeous texture being picked out very, very naturally. It's pretty easy as well. Still get it underneath, even though we've done that kind of lit from above effect with a spray. Those areas will be darker, but we still want the edges highlighted. Don't use a paper towel or something when you're doing this technique because, I mean, especially this, this is quite a matte paint anyway. What you'll do with a paper towel is you'll suck too much of the moisture out of the paint and the paint's just not made to behave in that way. And if you want chalky, dry looking, dry brushing, sucking the moisture out disproportionately to the pigment is the fastest way that you can make sure that you get that kind of effect that gives dry brushing a bad name. Okay, so now we've hit it with the all over brush. I'm gonna concentrate on the areas that are lighter Slightly heavier coats, there's a bit more on the brush. I'll remove less, still gonna test it. I'll go in gently with light pressure, just to make sure that we don't screw anything up. If you really wanted to exaggerate the effect from this dry brushing, you could prime it with a light gray instead. Okay, so, he's looking solid. Things are gonna accelerate very quickly at this point because we're moving on to our contrast. Wash the brush first. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing is using a lot of contrast paint in kind of a cascading order, and we're gonna be working with them fast while they're wet. Plenty of contrast medium on the go. And something else that's very helpful is I'm gonna be working with my painting reference just behind me. And if I'm ever in doubt about what I'm doing, I can quickly refer to that. If you want a large brush, I'd say three or bigger. I've got a three here. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna prepare my paints in order on my palette, and that's gonna allow me to work quicker. Skeleton horde, then we've got our Croxagor scales. Croxagor scales is strong. Pterodon turquoise, which behaves a little bit more like a wash than Croxagor scales. Both very lovely colors, they're quite similar. You could, um, you could skip one of these if you wanted to give yourself a slightly quicker paint job. And then we're actually gonna be going through to an emerald with the option to mix in a bit of a very strong black towards the end for the darker scales. To got all of those down and prepare some contrast medium. And that should be everything that we need. Let's go. So, contrast medium and skeleton horde. This is going down on the middle of the chest section. Now, if you use the skeleton horde neat like that, it's gonna turn things very, very brown. So, the dilution is really important. It's just gonna soften up the color and it takes it more in a kind of beigey direction, which is exactly what we're going for. Fade it a little bit past the section that we want, working very, very quickly here. And then if we've got too much anywhere, we can take it and dab it on the nose where it's also gonna be in this paint job. Probably goes up to about here. Now, next step is to take some of the next color, mix it in there. Wash our brush, go back to a purer version of the mix. We're gonna push it this way. Don't have to worry about being perfect with any of this. We've got some glazes later. That'll kind of soften things up for us. Pure version of the mix. Don't know what to do with his eyebrows. They're very dark on the paint job. Let's, uh, let's copy GW's approach. They are some fluffy eyebrows. 
Now I'm working quick, so do be aware that you might get some pooling and just be ready to go in. This is why you need a big brush, big belly to mop it up and remove it. Transitioning now to the other contrast for the 50-50 mix. This is going on pretty much neat. A small amount of this should really, really filter and cover pretty much any area that you put it on without too much difficulty. If you want any sections to be more vibrant, then you can of course do a second coat if you need. And you can absolutely go back and work in with the other paints as well. Now, about to transition to the back of the scales and the horns, I'm going to catch the beginning of the horns first and around the face put a line outside them, and then I'm gonna grab a bit of medium to use it to kind of phase these two together. Because the skeleton hood is so much softer, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna push away from the section where it is, wash my brush, get some more, push away from the section where it is again. As long as you're working quick, you can kind of fix mistakes that aren't yet fully dried. It's quite forgiving. That's good. Back to our strong mix. Probably the hardest bit of working fast is missing sections. Make sure you don't miss anywhere like under the chin. Really helpfully for us, this guy's got some metal bits on the end of his horns. So once we've got to there, we can stop. Right, green. Let's bring in some of the green first. A little bit of the black. See how strong this looks? Pretty strong. Remember, you can always do a second layer, so you're better off too weak than too strong. Just let it dry, or you can even go and add it in if it's really wet without too much of an issue. Definitely feel like I need more black in there, so we'll fix that soon, once we've done these horns. Obviously we're going over white, so this stuff's going to look a lot brighter as a result of that. Now, I'll go around to make sure we've not missed anywhere. Give it a quick hair dry, and then we can add some depth to these layers with some repeated layers. Mopping up excess anywhere. Especially in areas like that eye where we want to have a little bit of a play and do some nice work. Pooling will of course happen in recesses and towards the bottom of the model more. It's important not to change the model's orientation too much because while you've got wet paints on there, as wet as contrast, it'll tip them about in different directions and you don't want that because it's pretty obvious when a model's been played with while it's drying. Okay, that's it. Last sweep around to mop up excess sections or sections that have bled into each other. It's not as important if you're not using a hairdryer, but my hairdryer will blow these in every direction, so. We do not want too much excess anywhere at all. All right, I think we're good. All right, contrast is dry. It's a really good beginning, not perfect, but that's fine. So now we can concentrate on adding a bit more depth. Now you can use the contrast as a contrast again, or if you use it thinner, you can use it kind of like a glaze. So if you were to be glazing it, it'd look more like this. Thin layers and using it as a filter all over. Just blobbing less paint off your brush. And of course, if we want to, we can use it just like normal contrast and put it down thick. Now, if you do multiple layers thick, uh, you will end up clogging up the recesses. So do take care if you're doing that. You can just go in there and mop it out. If not, spread it out with a bit of medium like I'm doing there. Bear in mind the direction that you're pushing. and I'm definitely gonna evolve a bit more of the black in the mixing here, because I do want things to get pretty dark. Oh, not our dog, oh dear. Manchester's having a busy day today. So to avoid pulling too much, one of my techniques is I put the paint on the model, and then the first place that I put the paint, I basically use that as the palette for the rest of what I'm doing until I can't remove any paint from it. It's just going to make sure that you don't end up pulling overly. We're always pushing back from the light colour into the dark colour, not the other way around because we want to not pull that dark into our lighter areas. 
contamination is fine one way, but not the other. Okay, so that's the second stage done. Just going to darken up his whiskers. And I guess if we're doing that, we should hit the eyebrows as well. Cool, another hair dry time. Still referring to my art reference because now we're going to start the highlights. So what we're going to be doing here, something very simple, we're using one paint. We're going to be using Screaming Skull for everything. And it's going to be Screaming Skull plus whatever colour is underneath it. Where those colours are a contrast, that's absolutely fine. We're going to be using them like powerful inks, which is very close to what they are. And they're going to tint this Screaming Skull in one direction or another. Okay, so grab a bit of the Screaming Skull, dilute it. Using a size two here, we're painting a bust, but we're going for quite a fast paint job, so I'm going to encourage ourselves to go pretty quick. Just like we did with the washes, we can go 50-50, mix things together, and we're going to be taking that approach for everywhere. Going really fast, don't worry about things being perfect. Hopefully the fact that we've got such a cohesive scheme is going to help us get a nice result on him pretty quick. It's up to you how heavy you want to go on the highlighting, or if you want to do it at all. You could do similar with dry brushing. Just depends what level of paint job that you're going for, really. And the time that you've got available. If in any doubt where to highlight at all, you can just follow where your contrast has pulled the least. So that should be against edges and the opposite of uh, the recesses. So anywhere where it's kind of been pushed away, you can pop your highlights down there. That way they'll be going against a color that's more similar to themselves and things look a little bit more subtle. It's also a bit more forgiving for you as a painter. Repeat the process again on the other side, ending our strokes towards the bit that we want to be the lightest. You'll know if you've gone too wrong, uh, like if it's still the too close to the previous colour, and if so, just mix more of the next colour in, things will be fine. You might have issues with your brush drying out as you go, we're going super quick, so you've actually got quite a lot of paint leaving it. That's one of the reasons I recommend using a larger one, it's just much more helpful for this stage of the technique. So, at this stage, I'll carry on working here, rather than jumping to the face yet, we can be pretty confident in using a little bit more of our Screaming Skull and pop in some highlights. Very easy here after spraying, just copy the areas where the sprays hit the most. You'll end up with a pretty natural looking effect. But you want to be drawing attention to the face so we're fine with that being pretty light. We're also going to take more time when painting the face. Particular areas like this cheekbone are just wonderful sculpting, so we're going to give that a bit of love. Just to make sure that whoever is looking at it pays attention to the nicest bits of the model. See, so yeah, I'm working a long time before going to the palette. Again, bigger brush is much more helpful for this. Just holds more paint. Might be time to jump to a smaller brush soon. 
feel the bigger brush is uh, slowly becoming less helpful than it is helpful. Yeah. So I'm not going to make a small jump, I'm going to make a very big jump right down, probably to a, either a double or a triple zero. Because we're about to spend a load of time painfully highlighting scales. We're good. So this is the stuff that's going to make or break the job. I'm going to take my time on it. It's upwards facing. It's literally on the face of the dragon. So we're going to take all the principles that we've used so far, and we're just going to do it on all the scales and horns and bits around the face. Now we're all screwed up like there. You know, let's say we went too light. We've got contrast on the table, so it's very, very easy to fix. Make it into a glaze. And we can just push it back down into exactly this color that's underneath it. Mistakes be fixed like that would be really easy. We can go right up to pretty much a pure version of our screaming skull in the sections that we want to bring attention to. And then we'll have the option to add white to that if we want as well. But overall, this should have a pretty great effect. Okay, so we're looking really good, but our piece is basically one color, there or thereabouts. We're not going to be involving anything crazy, but what we are going to do is bring in some caribou crimson. So I've got my reference piece up. What GW did on this paint job, which I really like, is that they've just used a tiny bit of it around the eye to bring attention to it. And that's exactly what I did on the first attempt of this model. So we're going to try and do something similar here. On a teeny tiny brush, double zero. Looking for pretty precise placements here. Now, this is a shade. It's not a contrast, so it's not as strong. It's a bit more forgiving. And we're definitely going to be leaning into that. So this area on the eye. What we want to do is gently glaze over it. Start from the outside and then push towards the middle. I'm also going to be using it to kind of line the lips. And over a couple of steps, just introducing a hint of that color should really help bring our piece to life. I'll probably aim a little bit of it in the cracks and just towards the mouth, and it's going to do quite a lot of work there. Likewise, we can take it and we can mix it with our uh, heavily used bone color, and then that will be used to highlight and bring attention more to the eye. We do want to bring a lot of attention to it to really key part of the piece, particularly from the aspect that we've chosen. So yeah, we're going to be using that just to uh, level things up. And um, basically that's the type of effect that we're aiming for. So mix with the bone just to show you. you can get a nice little fleshy color. And having that one or two different sections, the only parts of the model that are a different color, is really going to pull attention right into them. And it's really nice for us because it gives us a little bit of a reason to spend five minutes getting the eyes right, and they're going to do a massive amount of work for the piece. Okay, so due to the joys of having multiple versions of the same model on the table, I can show you a very clear comparative result between adding white and not to your highlights. So just exactly the same areas that I've highlighted here. Uh, this has been the speedy approach. Um, I'm, I, think I might actually prefer this one all in all. This is more striking under bad light by a long way. So if you're going to events, you know, adding white for highlights, it's not particularly, it's not like the smartest way to do it, but it is very effective. And under awful lighting, it's extremely effective. Um, it doesn't stand up quite so well under amazing lighting. Um, Anyway, yeah, so this one's had, had white added and I've concentrated more around the face. That's really pulling attention in there. If I turn my light down there, you can see how much more it pops. So um, yeah, we're just adding white to the highlights here. That's made it pop out a little bit. I'm going to finish off his eye and then I'm going to complete these. What I'm probably going to do is varnish the entire thing before I do the metallics because I want metallics to be shiny because they're true metallics. So. Uh, yeah, it's coming on well. We're just going to dot the eye, literally, do a little bit of crispening off of stuff, but uh, he's looking really good. That's fun. That's a great way to learn and try techniques, and you end up with a little bust of your own to pop in a cabinet or something. All right. 
wasn't a complete failure. And for me, if you don't completely fail with eyes, you just have to accept that maybe that's as good as you're gonna get. So it's probably nearly as far as I'll go with his iris. That's enough. Okay, and then we want, importantly for something like a, a dot, which we're doing for the pupil, you want the right amount of paint on your brush and you want it the right dilution. So you want it to flow off easily, but then not be too much. So I'm taking any excess off the side of the brush. There we go, that'll do for me. Now with that done, I want to bring back a little bit more of the Carabao Crimson just to really pull attention to the eye as a different coloured part of the miniature. Last but not least, let's see if we can summon up the, uh, the kahunas to do a dot on the eye. Let's go with a little glint here. We've got a very strong white. I feel like that's the wrong place. Don't normally do work quite this precise. It's driving me crazy, <laughs> especially on camera. Not quite my speciality. All right, I'm gonna fix the rest of this off camera before I end up smashing my model. But uh, yeah, everyone struggles with eyes, guys. It's not just you. All right, we'll fix it, we'll get there. All right, that's it. As I said in the intro, I already had loads of fun doing this, like loads of fun, even though I had to do it twice, which is always just soul destroying. Now I've got two dragons. So the technique's really good. Uh, you can slow it down. You can do the highlights more techily. You can speed it up. You can use less highlights and use the contrast part more and just hit a few key aspects. It's a great way to try out different color schemes. There is a brilliant, brilliant, I think it's the, uh, the Axeman's Hood Gargant which I would like to paint the one with a kind of half-covered face. I think that would be an awesome one for this technique. If I do it again, that will be what I do it on the first time, at the very least. Let us know your thoughts or feelings on it. This cabinet's behind me. They're really nice. I've dusted the bottom two. I put eight-year-old models in the top ones without dusting them first. That's a bad move. Don't do that. My models have never looked this nice. Honestly, like, I got slightly emotional when I put them in. Like, they just look brilliant. Um, we spent a long time designing these cabinets. If anyone has any questions about them, uh, please let me know uh, down below. I'm more than happy to answer each and every one. I'll run through a few of the key features. They're dust free completely. The fronts are difficult at this angle, but they're just magnetized on and off. The lighting is included with them. They're mains powered um, and the lighting faces backwards towards the models, which makes a load of sense apparently, but most cabinets like from on top or places like that, it's just nowhere near as good. We've also used a 6,000 Kelvin, this is technical information, I think I got it right though, um, light there. So that is the most accurate lighting that my models have ever been hit with. What I've ever wanted is for that turquoise to look exactly as between green and blue as it does, and normally it looks one or the other. It's wonderful that it looks like that. It's showing up a few mistakes in my models, so it's made me want to go back and spend a bit more time on them, but it's wonderful. There's a few different shapes of shelves in there as well. You can see we've got some people kind of sticking up through shelves. We've got some wiggly ones to accommodate for whatever models you've got, and I actually have boosted the depth of my cabinets once to make them a little bit deeper. You can see we've got a prime in there. He's on a bigger base, so that just allows you to accommodate for a bit more. They will elevate any space you put them in. This isn't like ugly, wobbly, not even dust-free stuff that makes horrible noises when you open it. 
um, that you're just going to put in the garage. Like these are absolutely beautiful. These can go any room in the house. And also you can change the frames to match, you know, whatever furniture you've got. Any questions at all on the campaign, please do ask them. And any suggestions for more videos like this one, because I had real fun doing this. Um, and I think quite a lot of other people will have fun trying it out. Please do let me know. We've got some more Lord of Change videos coming up soon. We're paying a staff. It was going to be one way. It's now two ways. It might end up being three ways. That is going to be a big video and it's going to be a really deep dive into technical dry brushing, which we're going to do on a couple more videos coming up until we've done everything needed to paint an entire lot of change, at which point we might as well just paint an entire lot of change. That's it. Thank you very much for watching. Please check out the Kickstarter. Please like, please comment, please subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next video.